Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our sermon for today is based on a reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call him Jesus. He will be great, and we will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the, his descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So. The Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And those who are said to be able to unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. The word of the Lord. Dear friend in Christ, it's not easy to steal an election. Your opponents are watching very carefully to make sure every vote is counted. There are also international observers who are watching carefully to make sure that no fake ballots are included in the count. If you're going to steal an election, you have to bribe the election officials to look the other way while you are cheating. And if you're going to steal an election, you have to intimidate the voters who are against you, prevent them from casting their ballots. If you're going to steal an election, then you have to have control over the courts so that your opponent can't challenge the results. If you're going to steal an election, then you must be in control of the police, so that they will arrest any journalists who try to stir up trouble. If you're going to steal an election, you have to be in control of a lot of people. You know, it takes such great effort to steal an election, it almost seems impossible that anybody could actually do it. But sometimes the loser of an election accuses his opponent of fraud. Was there cheating or not? It's hard to prove. In any case, once that accusation has been made, People have doubts about the results of the election. Thousands of people may go out on the street to protest. They may break the laws of their country and destroy property. They may spread rumors and conspiracy theories over the Internet. In some cases, the people may arm themselves with weapons and take control of the government by force. In the Bible, God tells Christians to submit to the governing authorities. God has given the government responsibility to maintain law and order. And God expects you and I to 
obey and respect our government leaders whether or not we voted for them. God expects you and me to obey the laws of our country whether or not we think they are fair. God has also given the government incredible power to punish those who break the laws. For example, if you break the laws in your country, maybe you will pay a fine. And maybe you will go to prison. In some parts of the world, if you break the laws of the country, you may disappear. 2,000 years ago, a man named King Herod ruled over the Jewish people. Herod was a cruel despot and a dictator who murdered his wife and his sons because he was afraid they wanted to steal his throne. The emperor of the Roman Empire, Caesar Augustus, once said, it is better to be Herod's pig than his son. Now, during this COVID-19 pandemic, it has been challenging for us to obey all of our government's laws about wearing masks and washing our hands and keeping social distances and avoiding large crowds and staying home during a lockdown. Now, let's be honest. Sometimes we obey those rules. Other times, we don't. Well, what about obeying God's laws? How good a job do we do of that? Well, that depends on how you view God. Many people believe that God rewards those people who obey him and that God punishes those people who disobey him. All right, so you try to obey the Ten Commandments the best of your ability. That's why you don't go into your neighbor's house during the night to take his television or his phone because, you know, the Bible says don't steal. But when your friend gives you an illegal copy of a movie, you watch it. Or let's say that your best friend has a beautiful wife. Well, you would never think of going behind your friend's back and sleeping with his wife because the Bible says don't commit adultery. But sometimes you look at pornographic pictures on the internet. Or let's say, for example, you would never think of bringing a false accusation against your neighbor and take him to court so that you could get money. You know the Bible says, don't bear false witness against your neighbor. But when you hear a rumor that your friend has done something bad, you believe it without even asking any questions. So, do you find it easier to obey some commands of God than others? Well, let me ask, what do you expect to receive from God? A reward or punishment? In the book of Romans, the Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The truth is that none of us are very good at obeying God. And we know it. That's why whenever we suffer something bad, we automatically think that God is punishing us for our bad behavior. Or when something bad happens to a loved one, 
we wonder why would a loving God take somebody that we care so much about away from us? Or is it really true that God rewards those people who obey him? If that's true, then where's my reward? I've been serving God my whole life, and yet I still get sick. I am not rich, and I am suffering. While there are plenty of other people out there who are doing just fine without God. How good a job are you doing obeying God? Will you receive a reward or a punishment from Him? Well, to be honest, if God punishes those who disobey Him and I disobey Him, then I guess I'd rather be God's pig than be His son. But if we take a closer look at the words from the angel Gabriel that I read to you a few minutes ago, you'll see that Jesus is not a despot or a dictator. He's a very different kind of ruler. The angel's words show us how Jesus came by his power. And they also show us what he's using his power for. The angel's words assure us you can trust your king. A king is not democratically elected. A king is born to power. The angel Gabriel's words show us that Jesus is a legitimate heir to the throne of King David. The angel says, God will give Jesus the throne of his father, David. Now, David was the most successful of all of Israel's kings. He was a mighty warrior. He expanded his country's borders. He's the most famous king the Jews ever had. In fact, to this day, on the flag of the modern state of Israel, there is a six-pointed star called the Star of David. But David's greatness doesn't come from anything that David did. David's greatness comes from a promise that God made him in the Old Testament in the book of 2 Samuel. There, God promised David that one of his descendants would sit on his throne and rule forever. Now, the flesh and blood descendants of King David ruled for almost 500 years. Then the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar captured Jerusalem and conquered the Jews, and they lost their independence. From that time on, they were ruled by kings from other countries. For a brief period of time, the Jews gained their independence and were ruled by the Hasmonean kings. But these kings were not descendants of David. And eventually, the armies of the Roman Empire invaded Israel and the Hasmonean dynasty came to an end. But Jesus is a legitimate heir to the throne of David, and he will reign forever. Let's take a look at his ancestry. Jesus' father, Joseph, was a flesh and blood descendant of King David. That's why Joseph went to Bethlehem, to the city of David, to register for the Roman census. And even though Joseph was not Jesus' biological father, he was Jesus' legal father, and that's all that matters. The Jews traced their ancestry back through the father's line, not the mother's. 
But Mary was also a flesh and blood descendant of David. So on both his father's side and on his mother's side, Jesus was a descendant of David. And Mary gave Jesus more than just a connection to King David. Mary gave Jesus a flesh and blood body. Now, Jesus was not an alien creature from another planet who came to Earth on a spaceship. Jesus was born from a mother the same way that you and I were born of a mother. That means that Jesus has a real flesh and blood body. Jesus' body could feel hunger and thirst, heat and cold, pain and pleasure, just like our bodies do. And Jesus did not wear his body like it was a mask or a costume. I mean, <laughs> I suppose I could dress myself in a chicken suit but I don't think I could convince any other chickens that I was a real chicken. And I certainly couldn't lay an egg. But Jesus didn't have to pretend he was human. Jesus had a real human nature. He had a human mind and human emotions. He had human strengths and human weaknesses. In the book of Hebrews, it says that Jesus was made to be like his brothers in every way, fully human. Jesus was not a superman who could block bullets with his bare hands, nor was Jesus an emotionless machine. Jesus was vulnerable to the attacks of both people and the devil. And so when Jesus' enemies disrespected him, it hurt. And when the devil tempted Jesus to avoid the cross, Jesus really struggled. In fact, Jesus struggled with every kind of temptation that has ever bothered human beings. But Jesus is very different from you and me in one very important way. Because Jesus' Father is God, Jesus was born without sin. Now, we are all born with a corrupt human nature. We call it original sin or inherited sin. Our natural instincts are the exact opposite of what God wants. Isn't it always easier to do what's wrong than what's right? Jesus was born of a virgin, a miracle. It has never happened ever again since then. That means that Jesus was born with a pure human nature. Jesus' human nature was like pure water from the top of a mountain spring where our human nature is like the brown, mucky water in a river. That's why Jesus never, ever gave in to the temptation to sin. And that's really what Jesus' mission was all about. What does his name mean? Jesus literally means God saves. And so Jesus is able to save us because he is both God and man. Jesus was able to obey the laws of God perfectly in our place. So, for example, Jesus submitted to his parents' rules and obeyed his government even because, honestly, we often disrespect those who are in authority over us. Jesus used his hands as a carpenter to earn a living because we are lazy and often complain that we don't get paid enough money. And Jesus allowed his enemies 
to arrest him, torture him, and put him to death in order to take the punishment that you and I deserve. Because Jesus was human, he was able to die. And because Jesus is God, his death pays for the sins of us all. Jesus is fully human and fully God. And so you are fully saved. That's why you can trust your king. He is not a cruel despot or a dictator. Jesus submitted willingly to the death on the cross. He sacrificed himself for you. So don't obey him because you're afraid he might punish you. He already suffered all the punishment in your place. And don't obey Jesus because you're trying to earn his favor. Jesus gives you everything that you need, even though you don't deserve it. And don't get discouraged when you fall into sin. Jesus has faced every sin and temptation that you have ever faced, and he will give you the strength to resist that temptation the next time it comes. You can trust your king. He doesn't have to cheat or steal or use force to get what he wants. Jesus already has all the power, and he will rule forever. All over the world, people are hearing about his kingdom and believing in him. The doors are wide open, and there are no limits on immigration. Trust your king and submit to him with a joyful and open heart. You are God's dearly loved child. Amen. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.